Molly Lynn Watt comes from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and she is a poet and an educator. She was a poetry teacher and editor for the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement Review, poetry teacher and editor for the Kent Street Writers Anthology, and founding editor for the Bagel Bard Anthologies. <coughs> She curated the monthly fireside readings for 10 years in the living room of Cambridge co-housing. And for writing, she is author of Shadow People, a chapbook with theme addressing incest. Consider this and civil rights update paired with Dr. King's I Have a Dream in Dallas Public Schools. And along with Daniel Lynn Watt, Molly also has co-authored and performs George and Ruth Songs and Letters of the Spanish Civil War, which is also on CD. Molly also is author of On Wings of a Song, A Journey into the Civil Rights Era, which is a memoir in a poetic sequence of the turbulent times of the civil rights movement. And a quote from Wendell Smith about her work notes, although Molly uses the first person, these poems are not about her or heroism. Rather, in them she bears witness to what if it happened to her, happened to many others, and by extension to all of us. Her poetry provides an opportunity for us to contemplate our history and ask ourselves, given current events, what we need to do to meet the challenge of her witness. So with that, I would like to introduce Molly Lynn Watt. Please give her a warm welcome. Civil Rights Update, 2014. The girl in skin-tight jeans strains toward the mirror, mascaras her lashes, adjusts a third earring, plugs in an iPod, flounces off in a wake of attitude. She knows the story. Her grandmother, not much older than she, packed up two babies, drove dusty Tennessee roads through drought-dry cotton fields where tenant farmers trying to register, trying to vote, were fired, were evicted, were harassed by the Klan. Her grandmother put her life on the line went to jail with babies in tow. But sometimes she wonders, why didn't grandma just stay home? She's serious about making a difference. Studied the example of Dr. King, starred as Rosa Parks in the play. She's steeped in the language of rights, argues about curfew, posts hopes on Facebook, imagines herself a singer, a doctor, an engineer, a poet, as if walking the aisles of TJ Maxx for a ready-made fit off the rack. Until bored, she tries a new way to make a difference. The girl, really a young woman, has not walked with the rhythmic feet of protest is unaware of the care activists used in dressing. Brill cream, excuse me, brill creamed hair, polished shoes, pressed shirts, clip on neckties, the kind that unclip when gripped. Their eyes on the prize, picking off big picture fights, bus boycotts, freedom rides, lunch counter sit-ins. They marched for jobs, votes, schools, singing songs to freedom's beat. This girl owns her civil rights, but cannot imagine her vote counts. She does not know she is living the dream, but must keep dreaming it, or the movement will stop. Jim Crow still tramps the street. 
this is a poetry sequence. So um, I want to say that we heard these wonderful uh, witness from Jane, and these are more witness to the times. And it's about a movement, and a movement, you know, is like um, a rushing river. Well, sometimes it goes around quiet bends and down to a trickle, but uh, it, it uh, isn't just one person. Dr. King had his period where he led us and inspired us and keeps on, but it was made up of thousands and thousands of people, such as Jane and myself, and you'll hear from other people today, too, who are in the movement. And um, people ask me, when did you join the movement? And I have to say, I was always in it, but maybe that's not true. I realize that I'm complicit, even if I wasn't born when things happen. So this is, that was the first poem in my poetic sequence, uh, that was the last poem in my poetic sequence, and now's the first. Yes. Yes, my people owned slaves, split husband from wife, traded parent from child, worked folks like mules, plowed with sinew and bone, watered fields with sweat, washed cotton with tears. Yes, this is the strain my forebearers passed to me. Slaves bought at auction, slaves sold for profit. Yes, my people were slave-holding midwives to the nation. My mother framed and hung a bill of sale in the parsonage parlor like an ongoing lynching. Yes, I must own my inheritance. Yes, I must strive for justice. So the moment when I became conscious that I might be in the civil rights movement was in 1946 when I was eight. Daddy takes me to meet Abe Lincoln. <laughs> On the Washington Mall, a girl steps off the bus. Her foot catches in the door. She tumbles to the street. The bus rumbles into motion, drags the child along the gutter. A soldier shakes his fist, howls and chases after. The gathering crowd begins to shriek. Daddy runs into the street. I tremble at his side. The bus is rolling at us. The driver honks the horn. Daddy stands up tall, holds his hand up like a cop, shouts, stop, for God's sake, stop. Brakes screech. The bus halts. The driver calls out, black or white? The crowd yells back, dead. The bus door releases. The girl slumps to the street, her party dress torn and bloody. The soldier father kneels, tries to soothe his daughter. Sirens sweep aside the crowd. Medics bear the girl away. Daddy hails a cab. Weeping, we wedge him with the father chase to the ER, wait for the verdict. She breathes. She will recover. Daddy grasps the soldier's hand. God be with you and your daughter. I brought mine to meet Abe Lincoln, but she met Jim Crow instead. When I was 20, 1958, I went to hear Billie Holiday sing Strange Fruit. It was a few months before she died. In a Connecticut nightclub, a woman enters through eddies of cigarette smoke, a gardenia behind her ear. Her white satin gown, 
too loose for her frame. Unsteady, she leans on an escort, makes her way to the stage, her ringed hands limp at her waist. She stares through the crowd, opens her ruby lips. A low, dry voice drips, flooding the room. Southern trees bear a strange fruit. Billy, head high, eyes shut, puts Jim Crow on stage. I am a witness under the live oak. I am the lynching party. I am the body swaying on the rope. I am not breathing. <coughs> Lady Day burns out note after note, scorching the darkness. Here is a strange and a bitter crop. Lady sways a little. Her escort helps her from the stage. Someone claps. Another joins. The room applauds as Lady Day fades away. I am 20, witnessing a double lynching, the body hanging in the song, the singer ravaged by the drugs. Well, remember 1963, that's where the heart of this story takes place, and that's what this is, a story on racism. In 1963, when Commissioner Bull Connor set dogs and hoses on children marching in the streets of Birmingham, when Reverend King wrote from Birmingham jail Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. When Governor Wallace stood on the university steps to block two African Americans from enrolling. When President Kennedy addressed the nation on a moral issue, old as the scriptures, clear as the Constitution. When Medgar Evers carrying t-shirts emblazoned with Jim Crow must go, took a bullet to the head. When many blamed peaceful demonstrators for provoking the violence, when the world watched the scattershot of nonviolent actions across the nation, when the world watched this play out like a made-for-TV movie series, a minor episode unfolded in Blount County, Tennessee. 15 black activists from Birmingham, 15 white volunteers from the North, led by a white couple from Massachusetts by way of Vermont. Up until this time, civil rights demonstrations had not been widely covered in the press. So you could say we're, we've made some progress. There are being they're everywhere in ours. Okay, let's see, I don't, I forgot to turn on my time here. Uh, Cheryl, what time? <laughs> I think I have eight more minutes. Okay, um, so we did all kinds of things. It wasn't just protesting and marching, as you heard from Jane, and, and she was more in the north, but uh, we did things uh, that were real work, that were problem solving, that were also kind of fun to a certain extent. And uh, so my first husband and I directed a work camp and we had these volunteers sent by Dr. King, 15 from Birmingham, and we had 15 volunteers from the North and we were building a facility that could be used for ro voter registration training in the South. There were not facilities that could be used that way. Blacks and whites were, it was illegal actually to coincide, to habitat in the same facility. And what was the law? Aha, anything contrary to local custom. It was contrary to local custom. Okay, so here's what a work camp looks like for those of you who might be curious. 
and I have gotten to the wrong. Here it is. Okay. Dawn ignites one log cabin kitchen, 30 mouths to feed from a secondhand refrigerator, four burners and an oven. I start coffee, boil up grits, pack my kids into the bug, follow mountain roads to town, disregard glares and honks, shop for groceries and hardware, and when the sun is high, back at camp, serve all the campers sandwich fixings. The women volunteers from northern colleges, white women, set on liberation, wear jeans and t-shirts, bandanas tied around their hair. They steady planks and carry water for men knocking tent platforms together, reeling electric cables to wire the kitchen, siphoning water through a hose to jerry-rig a shower. The Birmingham women, movement workers, black women intent on equal rights and justice, settle for a cabin day in jammies, cooking up a storm of cornbread laced with table scraps in a cast iron skillet, frying chicken with a glaze of smoke, simmering collard greens with onions. On the side, they keep a beauty parlor humming Heating straightening combs, applying royal crown hair dressing, twisting strips of paper bags, setting hair in waving flips. At day's end, they're ready, hair combed out and pretty, fresh pressed, a swish and glowing. They call the sweaty workers for a banquet of Southern style home cooking. I have two kids there. Remember the Crayola 64 packs, all those wonderful colors with the wonderful numbers? Well, I had a three-year-old, Robin. This is called Crayola World. Think of the names of the crayon colors. Robin draws sky blue arches. Burnt sun, burnt orange sun, sepia earth sprouts, forest green leaves. Maroon father straw, uh, strums raw umber guitar. Bittersweet mother holds pink flower. Purple sister sucks plum thumb. She leaves the center blank, surrounds the family with smiling black people dressed in magenta, teal blue, lemon yellow, she holds the white crayon, studies the empty space, studies her own skin. Why do they call me white? I'm tannish banana-ish. Puts down the crayon. I offer the peach labeled flesh, then hold up tan. She picks up black, draws herself in the center, that's me, the most beautifulest. One of the major first, one of the major victories of the civil rights movement was to get flesh renamed to peach. <laughs> okay, you have, you have to celebrate the little things. Okay, I'm going to. Um, okay, so um, our camp, we all were raided. The camp was raised. We were all put in jail. Um, I have some very moving poems about that in my book, but I'm going to jump to 1964 in Roxbury, where I was training people to go to Mississippi summer, having already gone through the fires of the Civil Rights Movement myself. It's called Outside Agitator. I'm training Boston volunteers for Mississippi Freedom Summer to use nonviolent resistance in the face of threats and epithets that will surely be hurled at them. I taunt them as I was taunted. Not fun. This job pulls on hard memories. One year since the raid and arrest. One year since our work camp was raised. 
One year of shame and nightmares. News breaks. Three civil rights workers missing in Mississippi, presumed slain. Cheney, Goodman, Schwerner. Silence descends on the room. I see shock on sober faces. Some weep. I can't think what to say. We take hands, form a circle. Someone hums. Da, 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 da. We join in singing. Yes, this time it was Mississippi, but we know it could be Tennessee, Connecticut, Vermont, or right here in Massachusetts. It could be us. We sing softly in prayer. We are not afraid to day. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. Well, the singing carries us, and the next day, every one of those young people returned to put their lives on the line and go to Mississippi. Thank you. The new Bethel Baptist Church is a one-room wooden building with an outhouse in the woods. As four of us white visitors entered through a side door with the officers of the congregation, the choir was singing, Savior, Don't You Pass Me By, led by a large woman with a wonderful voice who played the piano in a rolling gospel style. The entire congregation joined in, swelling the small building until it seemed it might burst. The main preacher, Reverend Houston, started softly, repeating a line or two from the Bible in a normal voice, then sang out the lines in a kind of chant, getting louder and more melodious until he was shouting to the heavens. He improvised as the congregation grew more and more excited. Some people stood up, swaying, waving arms, answering, Amen, that's right, as their neighbors fanned them with paper fans. One woman went into a frenzy, jumping, waving her arms wildly, shouting along with the preacher who now seemed to be chanting only to her. Suddenly she fainted. Her neighbors gathered round and fanned her vigorously. The choir launched into another rollicking gospel hymn. The singing washed away the emotion of the sermon in a great warm bath of sound. After the sermon was over, we were introduced as freedom riders from up north who helped to help, came to help us gain our freedom. I was taken by surprise, this is my first time, completely unprepared to speak. I stammered something about how happy I was to be there, how I hoped they would register and vote in the county election. The emotion of the service left me drained. I did not rise to the occasion. It took a couple of weeks for me to catch the rhythm, to find my own voice as a freedom preacher, to speak in a way that I could not have imagined possible. This is what I wrote. We use the idiom of religion all the time. Several people have told me that we were sent by God, that God has decreed their hour of freedom and that we are his messengers. It's up to us to show them that here and now freedom comes through the ballot. My standard speech goes something like this. You know, God didn't make but one race, the human race. God did not mean for some people to be slaves, to be bought and sold by other people. God didn't mean for white folks to have all the power and colored folks to have none. Now, we all know how Moses led the children of Israel out of slavery, but he could not have done that if no one had followed him. All this was punctuated by, amen, you're right, you say right. We came down here from the north to help you register and vote, but now you need to stand up for your own freedom. If you're not registered, get yourself down to Somerville next Wednesday, county seat of Fayette County, not Somerville, Mass. If you are registered, take someone else to Somerville. Take your father or mother, your wife, your husband, your sons and daughters. This is the time, this is the place to stand up for freedom. 
Freedom today means freedom to vote. Nobody's going to give it to you. You got to take it. You got to register so you can vote. And on August 6th, you've got to vote. Rapturous applause and cheering. And afterwards, outside the church, much shaking of hands. Thank you. Just a field. The size of the field at home toward parlance brush along the fence. But the snow is strewn with bodies and 7,000 men are missing. On the newsreel, a man turns bodies over, one by one by one. Another man speaks from the screen says, this, is this one yours? Is this one yours? And my mother, <clears throat> 17, who knew my father's division had been there, cries out after 70 years, body after body, and every one of them mine.